Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reimet the Classroom Live Learning Showcase, Authentic and Challenging Powerful Learning. My name is Nick Shiner. I am the Program Director for Peer-to-Peer -peer Professional Learning Communities and Maker Learning here at Digital Promise. I'm going to turn things over to the rest of our team in just a moment to say hello and introduce themselves. But we've got an exciting lineup for you tonight. We're going to be talking about project-based learning and financial literacy two very authentic and very challenging experiences. And we have some incredible educators lined up to speak to you about these topics tonight. As I said before, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to the rest of our team. As I said, I'm Nick Shiner, Program Director, Peer-to-Peer -peer Professional Learning Communities, as well as our maker learning work here. And next is Jasmine. Hi there, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Jasmine McCallum. I serve as the project manager for Educator Community Partnerships. Um, among uh, some of the things that I do, um, I do work on the Reinvent the Classroom Initiative with our HP Teaching Fellows. So excited that you're here. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Starian. Hi, everyone. Um, Starian Portia, Learning Experience Designer for Professional Learning Communities, including Reinvent the Classroom and the HP Teaching Fellowship, as well as the coach community. Uh, my background is in instructional coaching and um, I am also an ELA, Emerging Bilingual Specialist, so to call myself, and I'm located in Dallas by way of Kansas City. It's nice to be here with you all today. And I'm Rebecca. passing it to Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, all. Rebecca Banks, joining from Detroit, Michigan. I am the Partnership Manager with Digital Promise on the Educator Community Partnership Team. Um, really glad to be here. My background is in museum education, nonprofits. I've done some part partnership work with other organizations along with community development. I also have a background in curriculum writing. Um, and I'm super excited to be here tonight to learn alongside you all. Welcome. Thank you. And again, this work is not possible without this incredible team. I'm so thankful to work with them day in and day out. And they've put together an incredible uh, set of content for you tonight in, in partnership with the educators we have on board for this evening. So a little bit about Digital Promise. We are a global nonprofit working to expand opportunity for every learner. We work with educators, researchers, technology leaders, and communities to design, investigate, and scale innovations that support learners, especially those who have been historically and systemically excluded. We really work at the intersection of practice and research as well as working with technology edu uh, uh, technology leaders. Our mission and vision, uh, Digital Promise shapes the future of learning and it advances equitable education systems by bringing together solutions across research, practice, and technology. In, in layman's terms, in, in, in average speak, we work at that intersection, making sure that research informs practice, practice informs research, and technology is that through line for us but also is in service of what research and practice dictates that we need. Uh, we believe that every person should engage in powerful learning experiences that lead to a life of well-being, fulfillment, and economic mobility. I'm going to turn things over to Rebecca, and she'll talk to you a little bit about Digital Promise's North Star goals. Thanks, Nick. So our uh, real, our mission-wide organization is grounded in three primary North Star goals. Uh, these goals reflect the future of learning that we are all working to build. They are student-centered, equity-focused, and ambitious, just like the work we are doing to achieve them. So we know it's not easy. It's going to take collaboration across research, practice, and technology to tackle education's big tech challenges and push the bounds of what's possible for learners and educators. You can see uh, down there we have our, those three goals are 75% of historically and systematically excluded students in America are learning in education systems with the knowledge and tools to create the conditions for them to succeed. We are striving toward 30 million historically and systematically excluded students have, uh, having sustained and um, meaningful learning experiences of powerful learning, putting them on a path to post-secondary completion and finally, that 30 million historically and systematically excluded students are enabled to achieve post-secondary credentials that offer economic security, well-being, and agency. And we, our team hopes to impact those goals through our work with you and other educators across our communities. So thank you for being a, an important part of this work with us. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And now I get to talk to you a little bit about Reinvent the Classroom, which is one of our major peer-to-peer -peer professional learning communities. Uh, when I 
had the opportunity to become more involved with Dream at the Classroom just a few months ago, I jumped at the chance because this is by far one of my favorite things that Digital Promise does. In particular, talking about our HP Teaching Fellows, uh, what we do with our HP Teaching Fellows is we support innovative elementary and secondary school educators across the United States and Canada who demonstrate powerful teaching and learning with technology. You're going to hear from two of them tonight. Uh, what's really wonderful is that we get to do professional learning with these HP Teaching Fellows, and they in turn also share the amazing things that they are doing in their classrooms. It's really one of the highlights of my day to get to engage with them, learn from them, and learn with them, as well as impart the, the knowledge and the connections that we have to make sure that they have everything they need. This work is graciously funded by HP, Microsoft, and Intel, and we are thrilled to have them as partners in this work day in and day out. Uh, as you can see, our HP and Teaching Fellows are all over the United States and Canada. We now have 92 HP Teaching Fellows, uh, and we have 17 in Cohort 4, which is absolutely incredible. So you can see they are all over the place, and we are looking in the future, make sure every single one of these states and provinces is filled in. So as we move into the, the second half of the uh, academic year, and when we get into 2023, we will be sharing more information about hopefully rolling out a cohort five and talking about more uh, HP teaching fellows in the future. So tonight, uh, the theme of our work is uh, powerful learning. When we talk about all the work we do here at Digital Promise, powerful learning is at the core of everything that we do. Uh, the way that we frame it is in these four principles that you see, which are actually two pairs of principles. Last month, we talked about personal and accessible learning, and we had two incredible presentations there. Uh, the other principles are collaborative and connected, inquisitive and reflective. And then last but certainly not least, we'll be talking about authentic and challenging powerful learning tonight. And the way we describe that and define that is that when students are engaged in work that has an audience and impact outside of their classrooms, they're more motivated to persist in overcoming learning challenges. We want them to feel that sense of agency because of what they're doing, because of what they're doing is real and real to them. Authentic and challenging lessons develop the habits of mind that students need to be empathetic global citizens and engaged members of their community. We want our learners learning about their communities, working within their communities to solve real challenges that are relevant to them and those that are around them. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. I um, want to share a few essential questions for you all to think about to set your purpose and, and your focus while you're listening today with um, Jim and Manda. Um, the two essential questions that we have for tonight for you to kind of process is how can I transform the way my students learn by challenging them to tackle societal issues through PBL or project based learning? And how can financial literacy bridge real life skills across content areas and connect learners with local and with the broader digital community. Um, you'll also um, in the chat get a link a direct to the participant document for tonight, and this is just a place for you to process if you are a note taker. Um, where we have dropped resources from Amanda and Jim for you. So we'll reference it multiple times throughout the presentation, but just know that we've taken resources and made sure to house them in one place for you. And of course, throughout the presentation, we want to invite you to ask questions. We will make sure to have a Q&A after Jim and Amanda both present. So um, please feel free at any time to pop a question in the chat to one of the hosts, and we'll make sure to bring it up during, uh, during our Q&A. All right, and with that, I'm really excited to introduce James and Manda. James is a STEAM coordinator at South Fayette Township, McDonald, PA, and Manda is a business and technology educator in Baldwin City, Kansas. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Jim. Great, welcome everybody. I'm um, excited to be here tonight. So uh, as I go through this presentation, you're gonna hear some similar language to what Nick Starring and the others have already uh, addressed with you. And it's because I've been working with Digital Promise actually in some capacity for about six years now. Um, got my start actually in PBL with a thing called the Filmmaker Challenge, which I'll be sharing with you before we leave tonight. 
So um, what you can see here, just a few of the things that I do, uh, there's actually a lot more. I don't have all the badges and uh, certifications that a lot of you others have, but I am very much involved in invention education and I am an advisor for a number of invention challenges um, with, with the students at my school. So uh, these are just some of them, but if you're interested and want to learn about other opportunities, feel free to contact me at any time and I can let you know about some of those uh, challenges that your students can be involved in as well. So uh, when Nick and Starian came to me and asked me about authentic and challenging work, I immediately went to PBL because that's what I've spent uh, a good portion of the last decade doing. Um, I, I was an English teacher for 21 years and uh, about six years ago had an opportunity to go out to San Francisco and learn about maker education. And that kind of transformed things for me and began me on this journey of, of authentic and challenging learning. So um, fast forward to today, uh, when I think about authentic and challenging learning, uh, I think about all the experiences that I have. So I'm going to share some of those with you tonight and how to get started doing that if you're not familiar with, with how to begin that process. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding PBL, what it is. So we need to kind of understand what those terms are. First and foremost, authentic, as Nick said, is when students are engaged in learning that occurs outside of the classroom. Um, I like to say think community. Right. So what you see here are two instances of community um, that, that my, my students have dealt with in the uh, past. You can see this is a, the Roberto Clemente Bridge here in Pittsburgh. And despite the blue skies, this air is actually quite polluted. We have some of the worst air quality in the nation here in Pittsburgh. Um, and then these two uh, young ladies over here are students in the Western Pennsylvania School for the Blind. And this is their teacher, Nadine, uh, who we were able to work with uh, in, in the past years as well. So. Um, Right now, our students as high school students, they're positioned at one of the most idealistic times in their lives, right? They want to make change and, and be involved in the world around them. Um, so if we can offer them relevant, valuable, and authentic learning opportunities, um, basically what we're doing is we're giving these students a chance to cast them as change agents in their community. And they do become empathetic and global citizens through that process. <clears throat> Next is the idea of challenging learning. Um, this here is actually a photo that uh, I took from a family hike through Glacier National Park. And I think it serves as a good metaphor for what challenge is all about. Um, when I think of challenging, we're talking all about productive struggle, right? We want our students to fail forward. We say that all the time and we have to be there to help support that. But when you're doing challenging learning, you have high expectations. So I'm thinking of the summit, right? We have, we have a high place to get to. Um, we need to provide active support. So you can see here, my oldest son is actually looking back at my youngest and trying to give him some support, uh, get up the mountain, you know, because uh, his little legs are having a difficult time doing that. Um, but we also try to gauge activities that of a desirable difficulty, right? We think of uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. We're trying to just keep that carrot just a little bit ahead of where the students are. So we keep driving them forward. And uh, we also think about continuous feedback. You can kind of see my foot poking out here on the right hand side. And uh, I'm just giving them feedback like, hey, Ryan, you've done a great job so far. You know, you've, you've made it up this way, let's go. And, um, but also things like look out for the loose rock because if you, you know, this is a pano, so you're not really understanding how steep this is, but this is about a thousand foot drop off our left side. So, you know, be careful, watch out for loose rock, look for the waterfalls that are coming off, it's slippery here, you know? And when we do all of that, we prepare our students to encounter these challenging tasks with success. Um, <clears throat> When my, my youngest got to the top of where we were supposed to hike to, even though it was a strenuous hike and he'd never done anything like this before, he was thrilled with his achievement. And that's how your students are going to feel when they get through something difficult like a PBL experience. All right. Um, and if it's not challenging, right, then the kids aren't going to feel that personal connection to the task and it's not going to feel authentic to them. So we, we want to drive them with that challenge. And when we as educators focus on creating those authentic and challenging learning opportunities, we're ultimately preparing our kids to be called upon to solve the, the most difficult problems that our world has yet to solve. And we're preparing them for the future of learning. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later tonight in the uh, presentation called transdisciplinary learning. And I'll explain what that means in just a few minutes. So here's um, a, a little chart that just kind of tells you what project-based learning is and what it isn't. And so uh, unlike in the traditional project where students follow teacher-made directives year after year and the task really never changes, project-based learning is open-ended, it's collaborative, it promotes student agency, and it varies from year to year. It's never the same, 
It's a common misconception that teachers in project-based learning classrooms though disappear while their students run the show. And that's really couldn't be further from the truth. Our students need our guidance and perhaps really they need it more so in the PBL classroom. But rather than us being front and center and the star of the show, we've got our, um, we're working alongside our students and we're co-creating learning with them. So uh, PBL is anchored in sustained inquiry and it typically involves the creation of a product or a service. And I'll share some of those with you tonight as well. Uh, lastly, project-based learning is challenging and authentic to the real world and or our students' lives. And oftentimes it's both. So there are some very real challenges um, to doing PBL. And although it's a dynamic and rewarding learning experience for both the teacher and the student, um, there are a few things I'd like to address here that I've heard over the years. So teachers have talked a lot about uh, buy-in. You know, um, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of buy-in with, with the staff. They talk about issues of control and curriculum and whether or not they have the expertise to do it. Uh, how will I uh, take care of all the standards that I have to be responsible for? How do I have time for this? this? This is pretty, you know, intense work. And then ultimately just generalized frustration about where to begin because it, it just kind of seems overwhelming. So um, these are all valid concerns. And uh, tonight I believe that I have some equally legitimate responses to address them. Um, so first, what you can do is start small. You need to find someone who is willing to experiment. This can be a young teacher or it can be an old teacher looking like myself. It could be an old teacher looking to try something new uh, and, and experience a new challenge. Um, ultimately, what you're doing is you're trying to get someone that just wants to make a difference, right? And, and once you find that person, uh, this is a great opportunity for them to be able to do that. Um, what's really cool is once that one teacher starts to experience the joy and success of PBL, you can leverage that outcome into building more capacity with other teachers. And so that's one of the great parts of my job is getting to do that. Um, two, find the joy in the freedom of discovery, right? So you don't have to surrender control all at once. Um, basically, what I would advise anyone beginning this journey to do would be to start with a teacher created project. All right. And then as you gain and build trust with your students, you can begin to cede more and more control to them. Um, some teachers go, but, but I need to lecture. That's fine. If you have to lecture, lecture, but you only lecture when necessary. And what you're gonna find is that instead of students tuning out to lecture like they usually do, they're actually gonna pay more attention because now they're realizing that the lecture uh, is in context and it serves a distinct purpose to get them to a certain point in this PBL journey. So you'll actually see them engage more uh, because the, the content is engaging and intellectually challenging. So, the curriculum issue is real. I definitely feel that. Um, I have a huge amount of things to get through, but because you're not teaching things in isolation and as one-offs and you're doing a synthesis of things all together, uh, to, you know, you're actually doing more and, and faster because you're teaching a variety of skills that they have to use all the time every time they do these projects. <clears throat> um, as far as expertise and skill sets, I'm going to tell you right now, I do not have an engineering background, um, but I have learned a lot over the years and I'm still learning. But one of the really great things that I'm doing as a teacher is I'm leveraging my relationship building powers, right? So I think all of us as teachers are have a superpower to build relationships with students. What we need to do is also build relationships with industry partners and um, get them on board. I'll share with you a real quick thing. Uh, at a soccer game several years ago, one of my uh, son's friend's dad was sitting there and we started talking and I found out he was a graphic designer for Dick's Sporting Goods. One thing leads to another and within four weeks I have my kids working on a graphic design project where they're redesigning the pickleball packaging for the Monarch line. Um, so, you know, awesome opportunities, you know, they're all around you. You just have to you know, talk to people and build those relationships and you'll be surprised at what kind of things uh, you can bring into your classroom for your kids. So PBL actually aligns, I put that in quotation marks because it's honest, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one alignment, but it really aligns with common core state standards and next generation science standards because um, these standards are all moving students towards more conceptual understandings rather than explicit content knowledge. And PBL is uniquely poised to do that, right? Because um, 
what we're not really looking for with these standards is what is the right answer? We're looking for how to ask the right questions, right? And how to then find the best information and then take that information and apply it to the real world. So PBL is particularly well suited to that task and it belongs in your methods toolbox. Um, people say, I don't have time, you know, to do PBL. And I, you know, I'll start off with this. You don't have time to get students excited about learning, you know, and uh, they kind of look at me like, mm, what are you saying? You know, and it's like, well, I'm not picking on you, but like, really, we want our kids to be excited about learning, right? And when they're doing something authentic and challenging, they're going to be excited. Um, but to get to the issue of time, a, a really well designed PBL takes anywhere from three to seven weeks. Ideally, you want to be in a four to six week window. So these are, you know, very manageable within the span of a nine weeks, uh, or if you're doing trimester, or yeah, I think they call them trimesters, you're doing threes, um, you know, you can definitely get two of those off within a trimester. So definitely think about, you know, building this uh, in, into an opportunity if, if you uh, are worried about time, you, you have the time, go ahead and do it. And then finally, uh, I'm going to share with you tonight a little bit about how to go ahead and get started on this if you've never done one before. So when we start with a PBL, we have to first establish the context for why we're doing what we're doing. And this begins with some initial research. So that is called the context. Um, what we're going to do then is uh, we're going to, you know, get some compelling statistics, use numbers to tell the story of the problem. And once we do that, we're gonna to have to create an actionable sentence or a question that clearly defines who is experiencing the problem and why solving it is a vital thing to do. From there, we're gonna go ahead and create the task. And um, this is what the team that you've put together is going to do in order to address the problem statement. And lastly, we need to engage multiple lenses or uh, simply the perspectives in order to address the problem. So this is the PBL development template. I've included this in the, or Starian rather has actually included this in the resources for you. So um, we're gonna talk about all these different elements. There's more here than we'll be able to get to tonight and that's okay. Um, a lot of the stuff beyond what I go through is self-explanatory and it will help you to continue to build this out. So what you see here is a great way to begin the contextual research. This is called the hashtag search. Uh, simply go to Twitter or Instagram and search for topics using hashtags. Uh, I'm using here uh, tonight an example from what we did last year when we, when we worked on a project with air quality in Pittsburgh. And so you can see a couple of different hashtags there that they would have searched. If you're worried about safety, try some of these out before you actually have your students do it. And, and preview what's out there and available. Um, it can help you just you know, stave off any issues if your kids were wanting to go into a particularly sensitive topic. But by and large, um, this is a great way to begin and, and get some uh, good ideas really quickly. So here you can see, this is a contextual statement. In the issue of time, I'm not gonna read through this, but what's really interesting here is that Pittsburgh is a clean and green city, right? But it has terrible air quality. Hmm, that's odd. Why is it that way? Are you curious? And if you are, that's great because we have a lot of chronically bad air to clean up here so that our residents can breathe better and healthier, right? And this is the whole point of creating this contextual statement. It's like, what's, what's going on? What's the story? Why is it this way, right? It's just generating that authentic and challenging learning. So once we've got that contextual statement, we wanna transition to a problem statement that's gonna help us focus our, our uh, energies. And to do that, we label who our stakeholder is. Our stakeholders are the people who are affected by this problem. So in this case, who's affected by the air quality here in Pittsburgh, right? And they need a way to do what? Well, we'll talk about that in just a second. And why do they need to be able to do it? So here's what it looks like. The average Pittsburgh resident needs a way to reliably breathe clean air because the regional air quality continues to be among the worst in the nation, negatively affecting health. So this is actually the problem statement that my students generated last year when they were working on their issue. And um, some people, though, tell me that they don't like the problem statement, that they'd rather phrase it as a question that students have to answer. And that's perfectly acceptable as well. Um, there are certain design um, methods that will say that the problem statement should not be a statement. It should actually be a question. If you want to do that, that's fine. You just create what's called a how might we. So how might we utilize technology to improve air quality in the Pittsburgh region to ensure healthy breathing for all, all right? A little bit different, but it's tackling the same thing. Um, 
Once we've done that, we need to actually generate a task statement. So I like to co-create these with the kids, um, but this is what we came up with. Collaborate with your team to design an innovative and viable solution that utilizes technology to improve air quality and promote healthy breathing. Your solution should include a proof of concept that is sustainable. I define what proof of concept is at the bottom of the slide there. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what we have here is a, a really, you know, amazing thing uh, with all these different wonderful skills and resources and ideas that we're asking students to engage. And this is really authentic and, and challenging. Um, Ma'am, time is flying by. So uh, at this point, what we need to do is think about the lenses for looking at the work that we're about to do. I use the term transdisciplinary because ultimately um, we, we all know interdisciplinary, right? Like if I'm studying Frankenstein in an English classroom, I might go to you know biology and talk about genetics and, and that kind of thing. But transdisciplinary are those disciplines that transcend or go beyond the traditional disciplines that we learn in the academic settings. And these things are a synthesis of a number of disciplines. So they involve everything that students are learning in the school environment. Um, you can see the different types of lenses here. Uh, this will make more sense in just a second. So if I'm looking at things from a social lens, what I would be doing is thinking about what interactions amongst people are affected by this particular problem. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but again, you know, we're looking at these from all these different lenses and therefore asking different questions. So for example, if I'm looking at this from an economic perspective, I might say, what financial impact does air quality have on the economy? Or if I'm looking at it from a cultural lens, how are a community's culture and shared values impacted by air quality? I mean, these are kinds of questions that you wouldn't necessarily ask, right? But that's what that's the whole purpose of the lenses. The lenses get us into this really difficult territory that's going to make challenging learning for our students, and they're going to have to really work hard to find authentic answers to. Uh, one of the great byproducts of this particular process is that you can learn about uh, emerging occupational opportunities for students. So one of the things that came out of our work last year was this idea of an environmental sociologist, which I didn't even know was a thing, um, but my students found out about it. And we had one girl who graduated last year and she's now studying environmental sociology. So uh, it's pretty cool stuff. And it, you know, you can see down here, look at this. It involves health and the environment, globalization and mechanism behind environmental justice. If that isn't transdisciplinary, I don't know what is, right? But um, there it is. You know, great stuff. So what I didn't share with you is that tackling air quality is a really big ask for high school students. Um, in fact, uh, the issue of air quality is what we actually call in the design world a wicked problem. It is a problem that defies solution because it is terribly complex. It has crazy economics and its policy implications are just you know, massive, right? So, but these really are the problems that need the most solving. So if you're interested in doing this kind of work in your classroom, um, try considering the UN sustainability goals. These are uh, easily uh, searchable on the web. And these are 17 areas of future concern uh, that the UN has identified. And if you look carefully at the labels here, you'll see that air quality actually has multiple connections across several of these goals. All right, so this is that transdisciplinary approach that I was just talking about. These UN goals embody the authentic and challenging tasks that remain unsolved, but that we must prepare our students to confront in whatever capacity they are able, okay? So um, last slide, here we go. Uh, we don't have the time tonight, but I, I've included this in the resources because uh, this is a video that provides a really detailed look at PBL. Um, this is from a project, this is the one I was telling you about at the beginning. This is the Filmmaker Challenge project that got me into all this work in the first place. Um, but we were we were blessed to be able to win both of the uh, high school awards that year for that particular event. And this was work that we did um, that tackled the problem of opioid abuse within our community. And we created a solution called LockRx. So I hope you'll take the time to get to see that because it really is an awesome thing. And the kids actually have uh, a utility patent on that work. And even though uh, two of them have gone on to become engineers. They are still uh, working on refining that prototype and trying to take it to market. So very cool work. All right. I have talked enough. Amanda is excited to get uh, up and running here in a few minutes, but does anyone have any questions for me? Awesome. Everything you shared was so great. Um, we've got one question for you while people think of anything that they would like to put in the chat that way give some everyone some time to type or a time to think about what they'd like to ask. Um, and that would just be, you know, 
when you're doing PBL as opposed to a regular project, do you still assign students roles or do you have the students choose their own roles? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I first started, I had defined roles. Um, now that I would consider myself, no, I'm not an expert. I, I don't know that I'll ever be, right? Because I'm always learning new things. But um, now that I would consider myself a veteran of this process, um, I like to approach it more organically. And so I like to, um, as, it, as we're going through that initial phase, kind of identify what students' strengths are and where their abilities lie. And we do a lot of inventorying of our different skill sets. Uh, if we're missing skill sets that we need, we go out and find them through community partners. So does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, anybody else who want to um, pose a question to Jim today? It means your presentation was really thorough, by the way. That's exactly what that sound means. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm looking forward to hearing Amanda here in a few minutes. Thank you so much, Jim. We really appreciate it. And as they just said, we're going to be turning things over to Amanda Voth now, who's going to be talking about financial literacy for powerful learning. Take it away, Amanda. All right. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation, Jim. I am Amanda Voth, and I will be presenting on uh, financial literacy for junior high students. So a little bit about what, about what I teach. I have computer foundations, introduction to coding, robotics, and career and life planning, which is where I'll be focusing my methodologies for tonight's presentation. If you'll note this image on the right of the screen here, that is a bulldog. I am from Baldwin or teach in Baldwin City, and they are the Baldwin Bulldogs. Part of our entrepreneurship lessons was to design a t shirt, and then they had uh, the community of their peers, their teachers, and their parents vote on designs. This was one of the winning designs in which a local printing company did print them and sell them at cost to our students. So they have some pride in their school and pride in their shirts. Right. So the need for financial literacy comes from the Kansas State community stakeholders. Students need to be able to navigate the real world as they move out of our schools and into their own communities. They're getting their first jobs, even as young as our eighth graders, starting to be 13, 14 years old. They're uh, saving for college, wait, saving for those first cars. So they've got to be able to understand how to spend and save their money wisely. So that kind of moves us into our generational understandings of financial literacy. If you think about our baby boomers, they're the ones who started off with more manual ways of tracking their finances. They kept a checkbook. They had to balance their checkbook. They had to reconcile their bank accounts, use more traditional forms of cash, maybe a little bit of credit cards. They shop more in the storefronts. My mother to this day in her 70s refuses to use Amazon, where me coming into the Gen X generation, uh, we're using our debit cards, our credit cards, a little bit of the checkbook here and there. I think I keep one just in case. Uh, but then we kind of move into our millennials and our Gen Zs where they're using the alternative forms of payments and investments. Uh, Venmo, Cash App, getting food through DoorDash, uh, more online shopping. Um, and that shift to digital banking shows the need for students to understand how their money flows in and out of their accounts and also kind of being able to keep track of those accounts. So one of the articles I found in getting ready for this presentation was through Digital Promises, Authentic and Challenging Learning, where they talked about lived realities. And the reality is, is that not all of our students come from the same backgrounds. They don't come from homes that always teach them how to read a lease, create a resume, fill out a job application. Reality is, is that their grownups aren't always able to have the time, the energy, or the knowledge in financial literacy to be able to teach their students that. And as I introduce myself to my students at the beginning of the school year, one of the comments I hear often from parents is, I wish they taught us that in school, which is where my position comes in. It's providing real world concepts in financial literacy that are meaningful. They are providing students with 
the need to see that when I go to math class, I have to learn these formulas and these equations, but you have to apply using those with your different financial skills. Um, today, we were learning about the rule 72 with interest rates and doubling money. Um, they also have to see how the social factors uh, impact their money and investments as well. So I have essential questions that I need to address with my students because my learning for my students is learner-centered and concept-centered. Those essential questions are how will financial literacy impact students' lives when they start navigating and managing their own money, even if they do not need the skills in the immediate future? Um, also, what is some what meaning does the learning in the classroom have to their core classes? Making those cross-curricular connections so that they see they're not learning just in one room and it doesn't apply to the next. Um, so my process is, is to give my students a le lesson overview, giving them the pertinent information, but then they have to go kind of struggle and figure it out on their own. They have the option sometimes to work on their own, sometimes it's with a partner. Um, I really kind of push the partner work because it involves problem solving. It forces them to communicate and, with others and it um, helps them work through challenging concepts, especially financial literacy. Kind of helping them share that cognitive load where uh, two heads are better than one. Okay, uh, let's see. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so my student outcomes. Financial literacy is to create opportunities where that are authentic, so our students are successful and productive members of our community. They are learning how to fill out their job application, write a resume. They're understanding their taxes, they're with filling out W-2s and W-4s, making sure that they get those deductions and understanding those numbers correctly. Uh, picking job benefits and insurance, knowing what deductibles are, what are co-pays, create a family budget, which is one of our project-based learning activities, uh, learning how to read a lease, how building their credit can affect whether or not they are able to rent an apartment um, or not, and how to reconcile a bank statement. So these are skills that our students need so that they can meet their personal financial goals in smaller context of getting that first job, and able to be able to purchase their first car in a larger context, applying for loans for college and their first homes. So my activities or these activities are an opportunity to collaborate and or co-teach with your colleagues. It shows the students the cross-curricular connections and those real world connections that impact outside of the classroom. The lessons that we have connect to ELA, they have informational reading with learning how to read a lease, writing a cover letter and a resume, filling out a job application properly and knowing what those benefits are. The mathematics, basic math skills of balancing your checkbook, reconciling that to a bank statement, understanding credit reports, and um, the social studies aspect of how current events and natural disasters affect the stock market can affect their investments. Um, these are lessons that they need to help them understand their financial position. Are they able to rent? Are they able to afford to get a mortgage? And those connections that they need. Oops, oops sorry. One more thing. <laughs> I clicked ahead, my apologies. Um, it's really important that we define the relevance of the lesson, meaningful, make it mean, making it meaningful across all areas, having them see that outside of the classroom impact. Whenever you make your way over to my wakelet, you will see a connection to EverFi entrepreneurship. That is where that t-shirt lesson came from. Uh, the students were able to design it and go through the process of understanding marketing and a need for a product within a community. You'll also see our connections to our stock market game. This is a live action game that my students are actually participating in right now, where they are in groups. They've been given a virtual $100,000 to invest in the stock market. Uh, they are in competition with other uh, teams across the state and engaging in that, Do I? what is risk? Do we keep our investments? Do we need to sell our investments? 
Uh, there's a link to practical money skills where they learn about credits, loans, banking services, and buying a home, and as well as our project-based learning activity of our family budget where they have to pick a salary, they are looking up homes, seeing what the size homes they can afford, they're looking up cars and what cars they can afford, and building that budget off of their monthly income. And do I have any questions I can answer for you? Sorry, I talked really fast. That's okay. I, w I want to know more about the stock market game. Is this something that they do online? It is. So it is literally stockmarketgame.org. And they you register your teams for the uh, game. And I there are groups of three and four for my size classroom. We have a very small school of only about 400 students. So they get the, the stock market game foundation. It's called the CIF, CIFMA Foundation. They give you a ton of curriculum. They give you uh, all the background. What is a company? What is a stock? What are dividends? We go through all those lessons and then they invest their $100,000 and have to hopefully try and win the game. We are in the middle school region and I have students in first, second, and eighth place as of today. So we're excited about that. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have to get some stock tips from them. I think <laughs> I'm thinking that's probably a good idea. And I'm assuming technology use in this class is pretty heavy, right? Like it sounds like doing budgets, probably a lot of Microsoft Excel is my yes. guess. That's actually how we are keeping track of our stocks is they have oh, okay. to list what stocks they're invested in. They have to tell me how many they have of each share, what their current values are. Um, whenever they buy a stock, they have to keep track of that. And then when they sell a stock, I need to know when they sold it, how much they sold it for, and how many of their shares they sold. Because sometimes they'll have 25 shares and they're like, well, it went down a little bit today, but it was up the other day. So let's just only sell some of them so that they're able to kind of keep that tracking over time and see what's happening as their uh, stocks flow over the course of the 10 week period. Wait till they find out about trading fees. <laughs> oh no, they, they're charged. Oh, do they, they, they yeah. okay, so they get charged for trading? Wow, okay. Hey, yeah, $5 I, a trade. Wow, okay, yeah. very cool. I mean, awful, but very cool. <laughs> like. <laughs> I mean, it's all virtual. So. Yeah, no, I know, but I, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's definitely a real world lesson. That's amazing. I'd love to turn it over to anybody else who might have a question. I mean, when you all cover it, you cover it like between between Jim and Manda and Manda. So sorry about getting your last name wrong before it is Manda oh, Voth. You're uh, totally fine. I know. No, it's not. It's your name. It's important. Uh, but I do want to thank both of our presenters tonight and make sure that I get Manda's contact information up here mm -hmm. as well. Jim and Manda, thank you so much for all you've shared this evening. I know there's a ton for us to pour through. Uh, in all of the resources that have been gathered and, and shared. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. And thank you to our audience as well. We're gonna uh, go through a couple last slides to share more information. I'm gonna turn things over to Rebecca to share more about reInvent the Classroom. Thank you, Nick. I was looking for something else. Um, That's yes. okay. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to just go ahead and um, keep uh, keep an eye um, where you have some information to share. We have a survey. I'm going to drop these links in the chat um, and a bridge PDF version of today's session. Um, so we'd love it if you were able to check those out. Please feel free to keep engaging with us and with our with our um, with our presenters tonight on Twitter at hashtag reinvent the classroom. Awesome. And Starian's going to share some amazing micro credentials that we have available as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've handpicked three micro credentials for you today that align um, directly with everything that Jim and Manda shared. Um, 
challenge based learning, facilitating conversations about personal financial literacy, um, which is challenging, given that everyone comes from different lived realities and how to um, really focus on building empathy, but also uh, making sure students understand how to talk about it. Um, which I know is something that Amanda, Jim, and myself have talked about in preparation for today, as well as global competence, action, and engagement, really aligning with, um, you know, engaging with the community and realizing that there are problems out there that, that the youth will be able to solve in the future that we may not be able to solve right now. So um, these will be in the PDF file for you as well today, so that way you can access them if you're interested. Um, and the PDF file will be basically an abridged version of our presentation today, so that way you have access, full access to everything that um, has been shared with you all today. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Jasmine. Uh, Rebecca has shared in the chat our survey. We want to hear from you. Um, we're always looking to improve and to do things uh, better. Um, so if you have a few moments, we would truly appreciate your feedback um, so that we can continue making improvements as we have future events. So if you could, please take our survey.